Impact statement for the PolyMet project is adequate. Uh, I won't go editorial on, on the process by which we do ev environmental evaluations, but to spend six years determining that something is quote unquote adequate. Uh, when the real decision making process just begins now in terms of the permitting process and, and, and I think there are 23 different permits, federal and state that have to be uh, obtained and, and that's where the real uh, environmental review as far as I'm concerned is going to take place to determine that this is going to be a project that would be entirely as safe as humanly possible for the environment now and in the years to follow and furthermore that the company will commit to the the uh, hard currency necessary to guarantee Minnesotans that if something were to go in toward during the life of the project, which is estimated to be about 20 years or thereafter, that uh, that burden will not fall on Minnesota taxpayers. So this uh, this rigor begins now, and uh, we'll proceed from there. I, I remain genuinely undecided. I want to see what the uh, experts determine. PCA, DNR, and uh, outside consultants will bring in. We're bringing in a law firm from Washington to help us negotiate the intricacies of, of this uh, uh, project and we're bring, you know, hiring a financial assurance company to look at the uh, assurances that this company would be required to make to make sure this burden does not fall at any time on taxpayers. So there's, there's a you know, very, very important, this is a very important step obviously. It's been, been I believe six years in the making. But it's uh, now the beginning of a process that is not prejudged or, or preordained. Be glad to respond to questions. Well, when you say that you remain genuinely undecided, what kinds of problems could potentially crop up that would cause you to say no that this project ought not to go forward? Well, now the experts, the, you know, the state experts in terms of the environmental protections. I mean, that's paramount. This project's, you know, got to be assured that it's not going to contaminate uh, the environment in northeastern Minnesota. And I've always, I've always said that sound environmental protection and strong economic growth can, can coexist together. And that remains my objective for this project as well. And we need the jobs up there. We need the construction jobs. We need the operating jobs. Uh, but we also need to assure people who live up there and, and all of Minnesotans who, who treasure that, that northeastern Minnesota area of our state that uh, there's going to be, there's not going to be permanent damage done to the waters, the air, the land. And, uh, you know, whether that can be accomplished in the, in the, to the satisfaction of the experts at MPCA and DNR, as well as some of the federal agencies, you know, is, is an open question at this point. The, the EIS never did. The DNR's assessment was that the EIS is adequate, meaning that if the project is implemented as planned, that it will meet state standards, uh, water quality, water protection standards. Do you still have questions about that? Well, I don't have questions, but the, you know, the three criteria I'm going to read here that need to be met in statute for an EIS to be determined adequate is one, does the final EIS analyze the topics identified in the scoping? Two, does the final EIS respond to comments received on the draft EIS and supplemental draft EIS? And third, did the DNR follow the process established in state statute and rule for preparing an EIS? Those are the three criteria that have to be met for it to be determined to be adequate. I don't see anything in there about, uh, you know, what, what are the effects of this uh, environmentally or, or what's the effects on whatever you want to say. So that's to me is this is a point where the, that, 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 that scrutiny begins. Who makes the final call, Governor, on whether, in fact, the water is protected? Is that ultimately you that decides? Well, the MPCA makes its determination on its permits. DNR makes determination on its permits, and there's a final permit to mine. And I'm not going to interfere with the work of the agencies, but I certainly expect to have a say in that final decision at, at that point in time. And because it's also got to include, as I said, the financial assurances. And the, the scope of this goes beyond the environmental impacts has also got to make sure that, I mean, it's got to make sure that if PolyMet were to, is, is, when it ceases operations eventually, and if it were ceased to exist as a company or be sold, and now it's one third of owners, ownership by a, a you know, a Swiss uh, uh, 
corporation that, that you know we're not left holding the co the price tag for what, whatever might uh, ensue afterward. Governor, we've heard some wild numbers tossed around in terms of the financial uh, assurance package: 100 million, 300, 350 million. Where do you think that could fall? Are those numbers realistic? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm not qualified to make that assessment. That's why we're, we're in the finalizing the process with a, we put it on RFP to uh, bring in a, a firm with expertise in making these determinations so uh, we'll have every bit of possible, you know, assurance that, uh, that, that, that whatever the number is is, 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 is guaranteed money, it's hard money, and it's uh, not going to, not can be taken away. Governor, you say that you want to have a say in, the, in this. Since you are the boss of the commissioners, does that mean the decision is yours? Well, I won't allow there to be a decision that I fundamentally disagree with. But I'm not, I, I did not was not engaged in any aspect of the the EIS except to ask about the timetable for it. I didn't try to influence it one way or another. They had 50,000 comments from Minnesotans who wanted to influence it and exercise their, their proper right as citizens to to participate in, in that process. But I, I, I read the executive summary of both the draft and the final. I haven't read the, was it 2,300 pages or whatever, I must confess. But, you know, I, I did not try to influence the timetable. I did not try to influence their decisions or the outcome. I was kept informed by Commissioner Landwehr. And when it gets down to the permitting determinations, I'm not qualified to decide whether something meets this water standard or not. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to interfere with the work of the agencies, but the ultimate decision when it comes to the permit for mine, I, I mean, I want to get the honest judgment of, of uh, and I'll be tracking it as well, but of those who have been involved. But, you know, I'm, I'm the chief executive of the state of Minnesota. The commissioners serve at my uh, behest, and, and they report to me, and so I'm not going to try to evade my re responsibility. Governor, what is the timetable for getting that financial assurance firm on board and digging into the I think they're in the final stage of negotiation. MMB is in the final stage of negotiating a contract there. And this is separate from the other firm? From the law firm, yes. Governor, how about the timetable for this project in general? We just spoke with Senator Thomas Tony who's here, and he said he thinks mining could be up by next summer, 2017, no mining there. I can't say. I don't know. The, the, you know now, the 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 ES yes is determined adequate. The, the 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 company can submit its the you know permitting requests, and then I don't I don't know the details of, of either MPCA or DNR's review. And of course, some of it depends on the complexity of the project and the like. So I, I don't I honestly don't know. How far are you willing to go to defend this in court? Well, I uh, I I'm not a lawyer. Um, but uh, my personal opinion, a personal opinion has always been that, you know, whichever side is not satisfied with the outcome will pursue litigation. So, you know, that's one of the reasons we have a law firm uh, outside uh, the Attorney General's office, and she concurred with that, to her credit, so that we could have uh, whatever the outcome is uh, and whatever litigation ensues, we could have it both in terms of developing the, 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 the final um, legal documents and the like, uh, one way or the other, that we would have the best possible, you know, legal, le strongest possible le legal position legally for whatever decision is made. Is there a point where it becomes too expensive for the state to do that you just, we don't want to pay this much? Uh, I think given the scope of this project and the amount of money at stake, the number of jobs, everything else, and the, and the long-term environmental consequences, it's not money that uh, we would like to pay, but I, I hope there will be, be strong bipartisan support for the necessity to pay, uh, to bring in the outside expertise that we, we really must have. I mean, we're dealing with somebody who does these projects all over the world, and uh, this is the first one for the state of Minnesota, so we just, it stands, it's just being, being I think, fiscally responsible to say we want to get this right. Governor, earlier you stated you were still genuinely undecided. Can you explain again why that is? Well, I don't know what the permitting process is going to determine. I don't know what the a experts in the agencies are going to say is, uh, you know, acceptable or unacceptable. Uh, I don't know what commitments uh, uh, and, and changes the companies would be is willing to, to, to make in order to satisfy those environmental concerns. Same thing with the financial assurance. I want to make sure it's rock solid that people in Minnesota are not going to be on the hook in 20 years from now or 50 years from now. And, you know, I mean, whether the company agrees to that, uh, is, is, you know, still unknown. So, I mean, I, again, I think you have to let this process play itself out and see what issues come up. 
from all all sides of, of the the question, and and uh, I won't make a decision until you know those kind of determinations are as, as as clear as possible. Governor, if in fact that assurance is not rock solid, as you say, that Minnesota taxpayers wouldn't be on the hook if there was some problem, would that be a reason for you to say no that this project is not? Going to I'm not going to speculate, but we, I want it rock solid. Because I, again, during the course of the operation, you know the company's more on the line. But if whatever the lifetime of the project and with all the, you know, whatever follows after that, um, I want to make sure Minnesotans are protected. Have you, uh, Governor, uh, would you have any advice for any of your uh, executive department members who decide to leave state government to go work for Polymed? I'm not. I'm not. Is that a hypothetical? I'm not aware of anybody. Well. I'm not going to comment on that. Not a hypothetical. Anything else on this? I, su I support the. Uh, I'm not sure the federal government applies to applies to members of Congress that there's a one-year window. I think that's a uh, that's a good policy. A minimally minimal one-year policy. And for the record, I don't intend to become a lobbyist either in Minnesota or Washington. <laughs> you still have the impression that there is no legislation needed or uh, wanted. Out of this session for this project? I'm not proposing any. I, I, I can't speak for 201 legislators. Governor, given the likelihood this goes to court, what really are the chances of this decision, the permit, finally will be decided while you're in office? <laughs> Well, you guys keep trying to get me out of office. You know what you mean when I'm gone in three weeks? Is it still going to be? I got almost three years, and uh, I, I don't know what the timetable is going to be. And if it goes into court, I don't know whether it's state or federal. I have total control over their timetable. So, but uh, so I, I just I can't say. It, but I'm responsible for it now, and will be for the next two years and eleven months. So I'm here. But who's counting? Huh? But who's counting? That's right. Absolutely. Any questions on anything else? Governor, the uh, legislative auditors today released a report on the uh, county jail system and the mental health. Uh, have you had a chance to review that, and what are your thoughts on I just saw the first report. It's a story on it. I have not, uh, and I will. You know, it, it underscores the one I've told. You know, uh, Sheriff Stanick said one-third of the inmates in the Hennepin County jails are mentally ill. So we, we've got, you know, a, a significant overcrowding in our jails, which is another subject for the sentencing guidelines and that, that whole review. But we've got, and then with the 48-hour rule, we've got the people who are uh, jumping over, people have been waiting in line for months to come from s the private psychiatric and other hospitals to get into Anoka, who are now going right into Anoka. Over half the residents of Anoka now are, are, have come from the jails. And, uh, you know, they're, so the, the you know, you can't Im I can't imagine that the jails have much of a therapeutic program, especially with the overcrowding. And uh, then they come into a treatment modality and they're, you know, they've been accused, many of them, of violent crimes, and they're emotionally raw and everything else. They're being, you know, trying to be uh, treated along with the residents who are there for, you know, longer-term psychiatric problems. Well, I mean, I, I use the word crisis. I think we have a crisis in our whole mental health system, starting with uh, those who are in, in jails and the lack of capacity, and, and not only in Anoka, but the uh, lack of ability to, to capacity to move people who could f could function uh, better and be, receive better treatment uh, outside of Anoka when they're not commingled with a large population. We, we, there aren't the facilities available to, to, to move people into, into more therapeutic environments. So the whole system is backed up. We'll have recommendations for this legislature. It's a, they're expensive, uh, and it's not money that I would prefer to spend over early childhood or something, but it's money that I believe we, we absolutely have to spend. And and the other part of the sentencing guideline, and I don't know that that's going to be possible in this legislative session, is to look at the, the significant overcrowding in our jails and our prisons and uh, come to terms with what changes we can make. I don't think we should build another prison. I don't think we should take over Appleton. So, you know, our, our options are going to have to be better. Well, we can do some expansion at uh, a couple of facilities, as Commissioner Roy's recommended, but we're going to have to deal with the fact that we've got an ever-growing uh, population of people who need short-term or longer-term incarceration, and uh, we've got to we've got to look at our old ways of doing things and see how, how we can improve them. Governor, less than a week, of course, the legislature will be back in session. What are the first couple, three items that they ought to do when they come back? 
pass uh, re uh, retroactive unemployment benefits for 26 weeks for all the people in the Iron Range. They promised that. Uh, Senator Han said he was going to introduce legislation himself the first week to accomplish that. Uh, the speaker said that this you know, special session wasn't necessary; could wait till the regular session, and it ought to be a clean bill. Now they're, you know, for 29 million dollars in unemployment benefits for people who are out of work through no choice of their own, they want almost 300 million dollars in tax cuts for businesses as as a condition for passing that. I, I think that's just immoral. There ought to be separate consideration that the unemployment fund uh, can, can withstand a, a reduction. I, I would support that. But that determination has not been made. And to say that you're going to link the, the, you know, the, the lives and, and the, f the misfortunes of, of, of good people up in northeastern Minnesota to some contrived $300 million tax cut for businesses, I think, is just disgraceful. And then the real ID. Real ID again, clean. You know, take the shackles off of. Uh, uh, and I, please, as the speaker said, this matter has to be dealt with in this legislative session, uh, prospectively. The real ID. So we got to allow our our experts to talk to the experts at DHS and find out. I, I, you know, uh, uh, yeah, is it DHS, Human uh, Homeland Security. Yeah, DHS. They're DHS. Because uh, you know, ultimately, this is not about satisfying one group or another in the legislature. Ultimately, it's about satisfying the federal government so we can get out from under this uh, threat of loss of uh, travel privileges and the like. I, I know you're not going to tell us what your budget proposal. I'm not. But talking about mental health, talking about prisons and sex offenders, three issues you say prefer not to fund in, in a way. Is that going to take a lot of the available money? Yes. Yes, it will. And, and I'm going to try to persuade the legislature, as I've been persuaded, this is not things that we want to do. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. We want to provide good, good quality mental health care and, and treatment, for especially for innocent people who have those. But it's, it's, it's not money that I would, I would prefer not having to spend money on that and having that money available for early childhood education or uh, you know, other, other purposes. But I, I'm convinced of necessity, for one, in the, at Anoka and St. Peter, for the physical safety of the patients, the physical safety of the uh, personnel, the state people who work there under very difficult circumstances. I mean, those are the kind of things that me are just, just we, we have to do. What do you hope to come out of this session with, uh, uh, in terms of economic disparities? And are you concerned at all that this effort may have lost some steam over the course of the last several months? I, it can't. I don't think it has. And I think that. Uh, uh, groups of people out there who are rightfully saying that I can't let that happen. So I, I will have a significant funding proposal. It'll be, as I said to the the um, legislators preparing for the special session, I'm not going to fill up. I don't have a significant commitment of resources for the rest of this biennium, but I'm not going to load that up with all of my proposals or proposals that have been brought to me. I'll, I'll have some of those. But I, I want there to be room there for legislators and for groups uh, and organizations who are out there really dealing with these problems. And this has to be statewide to come forward. I mean, uh, uh, Senator Tomasoni and, and uh, Representative Hackbarth had a six-hour hearing and it showed the, you know, the level of interest in, in this. And, you know, th those ideas need to be brought, including people uh, there who were probably not part of the legislative process before, including them in the process of developing this uh, portfolio of, 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 of programs and initiatives, new and old, I think is, is going to what's going to produce the best possible product. So I, I'll have some recommendations, but I'm, I'm wide open to, to all, all in good and better ideas. Governor, you were uh, strongly endorsed and supported uh, Secretary Clinton and uh, Tuesday's caucuses. Uh, a pretty overwhelming majority of Minnesota Democrats uh, endorsed her opponent. What, what are your thoughts on, on that and the fact that most of most of your uh, fellow DFLers did sort of went in a different direction? Well, the DFL activists. There's a big difference between the the wonderful DFL activists. Uh, who I haven't always seen fit to support and endorse me in the past. So, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the voters of Minnesota. And, uh, you know, I respect their, the, you know, those who turn, made the effort to turn out both parties. It was just, tr you know, it was, <laughs> logistics were not uh, great, but it was really great to show Minnesotans responding to both uh, campaigns and uh, the presence of candidates here leading up to the uh, caucus. So, uh, you know, 
it's a good affirmation of that uh, grassroots democracy, but I don't think it's a representative population. Hillary Clinton, in my judgment, would have won a, a primary uh, handily in Minnesota. The, the polls I've seen statewide in terms of voting show that, support that. But, you know, that's the nature of the process, and that's the process. Uh, I uh, and Representative Garofalo has made a very constructive suggestion that we have a presidential primary. I think that's the way to, we should decide uh, Minnesota's preference for, for presidential races, not for others. But I think we got to have something that allows every Minnesotan uh, voter, Minnesota voter to participate in that, that, that process as, you know, that's going to decide who the next president of the United States is going to be. Sounds like you're going further than you did yesterday when you said you're open. Yeah, I had a chance to think about it overnight. But you're endorsing yeah, this idea. Yeah, well, I have to see the the details of it, and I hope it's not, you know, I, if it, is anything going to come out of the legislature this time just clean, pure, and focused on what they say? So I'm not going to endorse something when I don't know what it is. But I think the principle, I support the principle that uh, we should have a presidential primary and make it as widely as accessible as possible to to all Minnesotans. And the timing should be, as this one has gotten better, the timing should be to maximize the influence that Minnesotans have over the selection of the both parties' nominees to be our next president. Okay. Everybody good? I have one more. Um, some legislators this morning proposed a constitutional amendment, which I know you don't have say over, but you have a vote in all but to um, dedicate funding for those of us who are getting older, senior citizens and all who are disabled, and they want to um, add a tax basically on the top 4%, the wealthiest 4% of Minnesotans. I have to recuse, recuse myself. I have a direct conflict of interest in anything affecting senior citizens. Remember that when, whenever you um, sign something dealing with senior citizens, then. <laughs> What, what do you think? I don't. I don't know. I. I, ask, I, I don't know. And first, I've heard of it. I, I don't know. has had a bill in the past. This is the first time he's moved over a constitutional amendment. Okay. I don't know anything about it. Thanks, okay. Thank you.